Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our special program surrounding our current exhibition, Labor and Immigration. My name is Beth Davila Waldman, and I'm really proud to have been part of the SFAA's exhibition and programming team this past year. It's um, now June and our, our year anniversary, so happy birthday to SFAA. Uh, this anniversary, this uh, exhibition was co-curated by Tobin Nichols, Tobin and Christina Velasquez. Thank you so much for your amazing work. And um, Lucien Liu, we couldn't have pulled this off without you. He's the wizard behind the curtain. So Lucien, thank you so much um, for everything. Uh, this topic is so important. Um, you know, we really are happy um, to be bringing forth this opportunity for SFA community to share work that explores how immigrating to a new location can change one's life. Uh, work that re-examines objects that represent labor and the convention of coming and going, as well as work that invites viewers to consider the translation of life experiences related to labor and immigration. Labor and immigration are intertwined. They are part of multiple societal systems. As people find that they are taking journeys to find work, sustenance, and better opportunities for themselves and their families. Even in domestic settings, people often travel for long distances and change lifestyles for a better tomorrow. We're thankful to all the participating artists who are being featured throughout this month in July on our online Instagram platform. You know, reinventing the wheel here, <laughs> as we always did at SFAI. Uh, we love that we're extending um, our community's work through that platform. And today we've selected five artists to um, showcase the work because their work speaks in depth to a variety of uh, angles on the topic of labor and immigration. Um, so today, uh, each one of them will be presenting their work. Um, we'll be starting with Pablo D'Antoni, all the way from Spain, and then uh, Joshua Hashem Zadeh, live from LA, and Irene Carvajal is here from the Bay Area, Lynn Sachs, is here from Brooklyn and Rosario Soltero uh, is here with us from San Francisco. So um, thank you all for making the time to share your work today. Um, they'll each present their work for around three to five minutes and then I do wanna open it up to the audience. Um, you can put questions or comments in chat. Um, this is not a webinar, so organically you can ask a question um, to the artist um, or share comments. And then at the end, um, we will hopefully have some time too for some more dialogue or, or questions. Uh, so remember to include your comments and questions in the chat box. And um, I wanted to start by giving a, a brief introduction um, for Pablo. Uh, Lior, if you'll bring Pablo into the spotlight too. Thank you. Hi, Pablo. And you can unmute yourself. Um, so there we go. wonderful. So um, Pablo D'Antoni is a BFA from SFAI in 2001 in the interdisciplinary department, but also an MFA in painting from 2013. And he's an Argentine American who's lived in the United States, Argentina, Germany, and Spain. In addition to his degrees at SFAI, Pablo received a PhD in conservation and restoration of cultural goods from the Polytechnic University of Valencia, Spain in 2013. And he seems to have a very wonderful active career with 17 international shows and participated in fairs in New York, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia, Madrid, Valencia, Castellon, and Buenos Aires, amongst other cities. So we love that. Um, his paintings have also been collected by the Museo de Bellas Artes in Castello, Spain, and the Museum of Contemporary Latin American Art. He currently works for the IEP School in Castellon and continues to make art from his studio and uh, perhaps you can pronounce the city for me, Ben, uh, in Spain. What's the name of it? I'll, I'll pronounce it. It's Castellon. Castellon. The city there you go. Where, where I work, but I'm living in Benicassim, which is about 
10 minutes from it. Many cussing. Yeah. Perfect. Think, well, right, right with language, just for starters, uh, that, it's funny because you asked me to pronounce it and coming from Argentina, uh -huh. the double L would be pronounced Castellón. Right. And uh, the Spanish way is Castellón. So there's always subtle differences, no matter how close you might think you are to something. Very true. I hear that often from my mother, who's Peruvian. Uh, we talk about Castellano versus Spanish. <laughs> so often, a good part of our dinner conversations frequently, but yeah, so true. And, and part of this conversation um, are, are those differences. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'll let you take it away today. Pablo will be presenting a selection of his work from his Gray series, which um, has been posted um, as part of this exhibition. And it speaks to um, you know, the immigrant, immigrant experience of his own ancestry of Italian and Spanish descent who migrated to Argentina to create their new home. So mm -hmm. Pablo, thank you so much. If you wanna start by sharing your screen. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, you know, unfortunately I was looking for some images of, um, can you see it, uh, the line? Hello, can you guys see the line? We, no, we can see you no. and work behind you, but we don't see anything else. Oh. Okay, let me see. Should we remove the pin maybe? See, I'm, I'm pressing on share screen. The spotlight, I mean. Oh yeah, maybe move that. Let's try that now. Are you the window, Pablo? What's okay. that? Are you selecting the window you wanna share? Yeah, it's on. See, I see it, and I have pressed the green button, share screen, mm. and it's not happening, I guess. And you, you have to screen? Like you're hitting the share button in the bottom corner. Let's see. There we go. You got it. Now I have to go. Um, oh, me and computers. Okay, there you go. Can you see it now? Yes. Yep. Now, from where would I go right and left? Oh, there we go. Well, you know, I was looking for the very beginning of the series that actually started at the San Francisco Art Institute when we had the, the MFA studios on Market Street. Mm. And uh, right, right about that time, I think it was maybe 2001, I saw, um, I, I uh, uh, ran into a box of old photographs at my parents' place. And they were all images. They had all images of, of um, Argentine and Spanish and, and Italian people that had gone actually to Argentina. And uh, that's when I started asking my, my, my father about you know, our story. And it ends up being that um, our great, uh, my great grandfather was put in a, uh, in a ship during a pandemic by his mother in Cefalu, which is uh, Southern Italy, with a chef well, when he was 10 years old and he was just left with a chef. I think in the future, only his mother survived and the rest of his family was killed by the, by the plague. I can't remember if it was Black Plague, some Spanish fever or what it was, but, um, Anyhow, the, the first painting I made was of my grandfather and I was looking for it and I went through all my archives and I couldn't find all these first uh, uh, paintings and they must be somewhere else because I realized that, you know, time has evolved and so did uh, technology. So these are actually in folders with slides, the, the old school way of, of documenting work. So I have no, um, I don't have the start of my series. These might have some of my of my ancestors because you know that many pictures are standing in lines or in groups but it's also from the internet um searching for uh, for immigrants in line and I, I remember there was many not only in argentina but also in ellis island and you know we, we i guess we travel a lot and try to look for, for opportunities or for some reason we leave where we're from and, and we try to start anew somewhere else. And people have been doing that forever. And uh, 
this piece is, is part of that gray series where it also started with my older ones, where um, the main figures are more important than the background. And part of the explanation was that I was not familiar with the black and white old buildings in the background, but somehow I was even connected by blood with the people that I was seeing in the photographs. Um, concentrating more on labor, this is a picture of fishermen that they took. So my one of my um, on my on my father's side, I think grandparents was uh, was in that in that group of of fishermen. And this, I always thought of it as trying to depict a state of uncertainty. The background is like minimalist, as if Agnes Martin came to give me a hand <laughs> to finish the, the painting up. And uh, I remember people quite shocked at school because uh, my work was always very meticulous. And I remember in one critique, a student asked, just let me ask you one thing. Do you paint the backgrounds before or after you paint all those small figures? And I said, of course, after. And I've been doing that for a long time. This would happen much faster if I just um, put painted the background first and then painted the, the figures or the objects on top. But I like to have this, this um, it's like this uncleanliness that happens by the background invading the people that are painting. It's, it's very subtle and it's not even that planned. I mean, literally my plan is not to invade the figures and there's like an overlap that happens. And I feel it also speaks of, of matter of time and of, of different places as well. So I like to keep it like that and, and unlike the, the sticker effect that would appear if you put if you place the, the figures on top of an of a of an already painted background. This is a hundred and three immigrants and a horse, and I haven't counted them lately. But I remember at a show, there was a woman that came to me and she said, hundred and four. It's not hundred and three, or I, or I don't, or maybe the title was hundred and two, and she told me there was actually hundred and three. So she went through the time of counting every single. Uh, person in, in the painting. Here again, it's images from the internet that somewhere in there, there's, there's uh, family members of my, of my own uh, ancestry. And this one is, is called V just because of the shape. Immigrants in line, maybe from eight or, or, or more, even 10 photographs. And here the immigrants are standing. I don't know if you guys recognize that these figures up front are from the American Depression. So they're probably displaced Americans from the photography of Dorothea Lange. So the immigrants together with the displaced. I, you know, I fell in love with, with uh, her pictures immediately and I found like an immediate connection somehow. Although maybe these are with hope and, and these are truly struggling at a, at a moment in time. This is from something com completely different and, and it's where I'm not as um, like attached or part of it because this, this was when I saw some images of the Syrian conflict in the Mediterranean where boats with immigrants were coming and, and they were just uh, like literally drowned. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really, it, it's not masochistic at all because I, I really detest the, the, the context or, or, or the content of, of what I paint sometimes, but I feel that it, it needs to be, to be, uh, to be painting, painted and, and addressed. And actually what did shock me and, and got me started, like, you know, I had thought about it before when I saw some images because it was always, a big group of people and also immigrants. But there was an image that I don't know if you guys remember of, uh, of uh, like three-year-old that, uh, that, that, uh, that drowned and, and he died in a, in the on the Mediterranean coast, face down and an extremely shocking picture. 
And uh, I remember the, um, the jeans he was wearing and, and the t-shirt. My son had the same exact ones. And I was like, oof, this is like, I mean, that's just beyond pain. It's like un, un, undecipherable what, what uh, the family might have suffered when they saw that. And I said, I have to paint this. And it's like the mix in, 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 in something that, you know, I, I never wanted to call myself a surrealist. It's just like this ridiculous realism and, and the things that we have to go through and, and endure as, as humans and the amount of violence and death and, and, and injustice all put in a painting. But of course I, I, I had that image in my head but I didn't wanna display it. So it's without that, it's like this mystery state of what's happening. I, I kind of uh, ran into copyrights quite soon with it because in the background I had put in somewhat of a sarcastic tone, uh, what a wonderful world by, by Louis Armstrong. And they, I think it lasted like 10 minutes because you have to, um, I think you have to publish music that is older than, than something recorded in the 1930s. And it would go around all the images and when there was something violent or iffy in the picture would say, oh, what a wonderful world. Um, but you know, of course I think the opposite. Well, um, I'm just gonna jump in here because I think that's such a powerful last comment and I have to keep track of time a little bit, but um, I, you know, this, if, is this, uh, maybe we can stay on this last detail, uh, Pablo, um, that you just brought up here because I'm curious about the, the yeah. timeline and, um, or maybe the, is this a detail from the painting before? Yeah, and it's actually something that, um, see, if, if for some reason, technology did work great because, you know, people always see me and I see myself as a miniaturist. And what shocks me when I look at this up close, it's like a Bay Area figurative artist painted it. It's not, it's not that highly developed. And I guess it has to do with, uh, with uh, the detail, with, um, with a smallness of it that you just can't depict everything. So it's just stains to depict a uh, form, but you know, maybe I'm getting too technical when this, you know, the objective of all this is, is more contentual, right? Yeah, well, can you share the scale? Like for example, are these works, what is this, the scale of this painting that we're looking at right here? Well, I can't remember exactly. It's. 50 by 65, but that's in, in centimeters. This is like, um, I think it's 22 by 24 inches. Okay. So this is way over, um, over the, the, the actual size. Yeah, well this, um, this, and that gives us a sense for the entry points. Um, such beautiful work. It's it's really interesting to see just even in the the few pieces you showed us here, just the um, the passage of time. I'm curious if the early paintings you started with the photographs you found right from your ancestry from um, mm -hmm. that you found in 2001. Is that the much one? more simple? Much more simple. It's like as if Andy Warhol paid paid a visit to my studio, but a little more more rendered. I would say just. One figure, two, three at the most, and that was that. And and this, um, one of the changes is that the figures got much smaller, and I included many more in each painting. I want to um, like get the idea of this mass of people, but yet if you zoom in, each one will have its own individuality, which is ultimately what 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 we all want, I guess. Mm -hmm and be respected as, 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 uh, as different ind individuals, all from each other, right? Yeah, and I, I love the very inclusive um, way that you are bringing in the overall immigrant experience um, through, you know, the, 
this piece in particular speaks to a lot more current events and the earlier ones are, are um, back in time, but you've mentioned a number of things such as sourcing imagery from the internet or Ellis Island. I mean, there are probably a lot of entry points that you've brought into your work, you know, beyond your own um, family's experience. Exactly. Well, to, to, can I do some, uh, show something that very fast? Definitely. It's, um, well, another San Francisco Art Institute alumni that is uh, Mauricio Hector Pineda told me about some Central American conflict. Well, it's not a conflict. It's, it, it's people traveling on top of, of trains in the, in the rooftops, literally. Mm. And uh, from Central America and Mexico, mostly, to try to get to the border, to, to come in. And, you know, some of the pictures that, that inspired my last series are... Uh, are you know taken during the time when you know our former president was was planning on building a wall so they didn't come in so it, it's quite uh, contradictory and um, this is all it starts I can't remember the exact city I read it uh, and, and I forgot it but people start jumping on these freight trains. And this is happening like today, to go for the American dream or, or literally just to find, find a job because they might not have that in their, in their countries. And um, they don't even know if, if, if they're gonna survive the very ride. And this is the movement of the patronas that are these, these group of women that basically feed them. They just give them bags on the run. You know, while the train passes, they throw these bags of food and, and, and they became like, like an institution. They, I know they even have a Princess of Asturias you know, like, like human rights uh, uh, price. Well, I think, um, yeah, this piece is also uh, brings in another layer and I'm sorry to have to wrap up your yeah, yeah, that's but um, just the, 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 the system and the networks that occur as a result of the experience of immigration um, with the, the, the pro, you know, providing the bags of food. I mean, that starts to speak to, you know, these underlying um, networks of labor that start occurring to support the, the system of immigration. But um, um, yeah, I thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I am going to move on to our next artist, um, Irene. If um, maybe you'll, we can um, stop your shared screen. And ah, we'll have some time at the end. Feel free to put in any uh, comments into the chat. Um, and Christina, thank you for joining us. She has to go now. Thank you for- Bye -bye part of this show. Bye. We'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Great luck. And if we'll bring Irene on, um, Lior, if you can spotlight her. Um, Irene uh, Carvajal is an MFA from 2014. Um, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um, she is a multidisciplinary Costa Rican American artist. Her practice includes printmaking, collage, sculpture, video, performance, and installation. And thematically, her work touches upon the intersections of colonialism, labor, feminism, value, mass production, and environmentalism. So, so many wonderful layers there. She's an experimental conceptual artist interested in materiality and meaning making through the process of uh, of, through her process in the studio and her different selections of media. So her, mater her research has led her to explore sustainable alternatives to traditional methods and materials. So you'll find her work uh, very interesting in that manner. Um, Irena received her BFA from the University of Can Kansas and her MFA from SFAI, where she received the Bronze Roller Award, congratulations. Um, she exhibited and participated in residencies in the United States, Japan, Costa Rica, and most recently a residency at La Sierra Grafica in Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, Irena has also been actively teaching over the years, um, including at Stanford University at SFAI, where she served as the chair of the printmaking department um, in 2020, and currently she's at San Jose State University, correct? Yes. 
Great. Um, so Irana will be presenting work entitled Mislabeled, whose archaeological approach towards ex excavating utilitarian everyday and mass produced objects becomes something full of social meaning with modifications to geographic, historic, political, and cultural weight through her, her artistic transformations. So thank you, Irena, and I'll let her take it away. Beautiful, thanks. I'm gonna share my screen now. And um, the way I've set this up is we're gonna start and end with mislabeled so that we can kind of wrap up the, uh, the presentation. So uh, this is mislabeled. Uh, it's a piece uh, made out of a, a collage of uh, hundreds of um, garment labels stitched together and um, uh, without a plan. They, they just uh, came together and, and started becoming um, somewhat topographical to me and, and uh, reminiscent of a map. So, which, which really speaks to what I'm trying to talk about and the idea that garments are um, uh, geographical objects that, that actually have a history a way before they are, um, you know, adorning our body or protecting our body. They've had um, uh, quite a journey, uh, a global journey. And uh, my fascination with mass produced objects, oops, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Play. I don't know why that's, I was trying to. Okay, so I guess it's not going to happen that way. I'll just go one by one. Who cares? Um, uh, let me just delete all that. So my fascination with garments uh, started back in SFAI. And um, I was really interested in the idea of mass production and globalization and um, kind of trying to rescue um, or reveal the ghosts, the traces, the history uh, of, of garments and garment culture uh, way, as I said before, way beyond um, uh, the ultimate resting place of our bodies, right? And uh, thinking about uh, all the people that have touched this garment in its different iterations and, and how that history is already in the threads, if you will. If you will. So this piece in front of you is a collagraph. Um, a, a collagraph is a low relief um, uh, collage uh, that we run through the press. So basically, it, you know, marrying that idea of, of the formality of printmaking and, and the pressure of the press with the concepts of um, uh, the pressures of labor and uh, globalization and mass production and economy uh, kind of merging together. Um, of, of course, art is so generative, right, that uh, it takes us from one place to another. So um, I was interested in the garment as, um, as the possibilities of print, but also in the garment as a sculptural object as well. Um, and so uh, I've been, I've, I've never fancied myself a seamstress. I don't know the first thing about sewing, uh, but um, I was really interested in manipulating the garment uh, down to its uh, threads, you know, and, and the symbolism or the uh, the metaphor of society uh, that 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 was allowing me to have. So kind of playing with that idea of um, uh, the fabric and the thread, the individual and the society, and how uh, how those two work together uh, or or can disintegrate when when pulled apart. Um, I was also really interested in um, bringing to light, so let me back up for a minute. Uh, as Beth said, I'm from Costa Rica. And uh, back in 2010, I was visiting Costa Rica and realized that there were all these new stores I had never seen uh, called Ropa Usada Americana, uh, used American clothing, which all of us know, um, there's very few garments created in the United States. So I was curious as to why the, the, the name of these stores. Uh, so I went in, found out that uh, these are stores of used clothing that was used in the United States. So our consumerism, right, our, our explosion of consumerism um, has uh, created this 
uh, surplus of unwanted clothing. Uh, when we send it to the goodwill, we think we're doing a great thing, right? It, all, all the stuff that we don't want anymore. Uh, but the surplus, the goodwill and the Salvation Army and all these other organizations send their surplus of clothing to third world countries. And this clothing is really inexpensive, which we might think is, is good, but what's happening is it's destroying um, local micro economies, right? The seamstress of Costa Rica or, or the tailor of uh, Nicaragua no longer has um, a job that, uh, because of this uh, um, overproduction of clothing. Uh, so I started thinking about the idea of mending and how we've kind of lost the, the art of mending. Um, so uh, I've started mending objects and, and creating a mend that is very obvious, uh, it, tying back to ideas of um, in ceramics, uh, kintsugi, uh, the, the Japanese idea of mending with gold leaf and, and allowing the, uh, the break in the, in the, uh, in the, in the ceramics to, to be exalted, right? The same way um, as I am trying to exalt it in, um, uh, in the fabric. So um, art is so generative and that's one of the things that I love about it. One idea leads to another. Um, I started uh, thinking about the life of um, uh, and how interconnected uh, we all are in terms of our garments. Uh, so, uh, so I was thinking of um, creating some kind of a analogy to skin, right? The the the, the fabric being our skin. Um, so these are uh, uh, garments made out of latex, which of course latex has a relationship to our uh, to our protection. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of gloves or on condoms that are uh, made out of latex, and uh, the clothes as well uh, are serving as our second skin. Um, uh, but also thinking of metaphors such as when we are immigrants and we kind of shed part of our life in order to fit in in another um, in another place, um, it, and and the shedding of like a skin, the shedding of like like a snake or a, a reptile that sheds its skin. I'm going a little faster because I realize I'm running out of time. The next two pieces, um, and I'll just uh, show them quickly are um, created, uh, I'm also interested in the fact that um, immigration and uh, globalization and the expansion that started with colonialism uh, had to do with color in a way as well and with spices, right? We learned that when we were in grade school, the, um, the spice trade uh, was very interesting. Um, and, and when I think of color and how um, color also came into European, um, into the European world, uh, through the exploitation of other parts of the world. Uh, so these two pieces are made with uh, inks created with uh, turmeric, um, uh, achote, and arbol de mata, which is a type of indigo plant that, uh, that grows in Costa Rica. Um, this is, uh, as I showed you before, a collagraph plate um, and um, of, of a garment, uh, a garment created by me. It's, it's kind of a Frankenstein uh, grafted garment that, um, uh, it, that's it, trying to bring up it through patterns, the history of the different places where the garment uh, was created. So with that, um, patterns started becoming really important to me. And during my, um, uh, my residency at La Ceiba Grafica, I, uh, I started looking at the tiles uh, of this house. This house was a colonial house uh, that of course uh, meant that a lot of the tiles were brought from Spain. And when you follow that through, you know, the tiling work in Spain was also brought by the Moors. So this was a history uh, spanning hundreds of years of uh, colonial um, uh, uh, influence. Um, so the patterns started becoming very important to me. And lately during the pandemic, I've been um, working in performance art uh, on the beach. I live in Pacifica, uh, close to the beach where Gaspar de Portola first landed. And uh, in essence, uh, the exploitation by Europeans of, uh, of uh, San Francisco Bay started there. So I've been creating these um, uh, sand prints 
and uh, close to the ocean. I call them returned because my idea is that uh, these patterns belong to, um, you know, a Spanish uh, colonizing force and allowing uh, the ocean and the elements to destroy them and kind of bring it back to uh, nature. Um, and I've gone up Sweeney Ridge, which is uh, the path that the Spaniards took uh, up the mountain to see San Francisco. Um, and this is a, a, a meal, uh, a flower made out of uh, the oats that are uh, were the Ohlone Indians native food. Um, and again, I create these patterns and allow um, uh, the elements to destroy them, which brings me back to mislabeled. And yeah, that's a, definitely full circle. Yes. Isn't it? I, because you uh, started with speaking to where these different um, garment labels were coming from and connecting those sites here through this map light, like mm -hmm. the work. And, you know, your work as you presented it truly reconnected physically with ground, you know, with the sand, with um, yes. sight and and also through your your pigments and your spices brought in those layers of culture. Um, absolutely beautiful and great to see how you know one starting point can really allow you to travel through so many different mediums and um, and and locations um, and and you yourself have you know, um, traveled quite a bit, you know, for your, for your own work. So are you collecting some of these during your travels? Um, like for example, the, the garments, are these just collected from one studio site? Is one way? Um, so the, the, the garments I started um, is kind of crowdsourcing and um, which leads me to the work that I'm doing right now. Um, it, yeah. So I, I collect my garments through crowdsourcing and um, I just, uh, put up on, on my website or, or through the internet in some way. Um, uh, I sometimes go and stand in front of a Salvation Army Center and, and ask people to donate their, their clothing to me instead of to the Salvation Army. Um, uh, but, you know, it, the, the importance of research and of um, really it, groundwork, right? Like, uh, like field work, sorry, not groundwork, field work became really, really clear to me recently. So I've become a volunteer with an organization called Al Otro Lado, which helps immigrants from Central America, as uh, Pablo was speaking earlier, um, uh, and in um, filling out their paperwork and helping them navigate the uh, uh, legal system in the United States. Wow. Um, and um, I'm now collaborating with some of these uh, people who were willing to share their stories with me. And the next project that I'm doing um, coming up soon is I'm intervening um, billboards in Tijuana, uh, digital billboards with the artwork that's coming up that emerged from my interactions with, um, uh, with these uh, people who are in this weird liminal space of waiting, right? Waiting to see what the United States allows them to do or not to do. Yeah, wow, that's so powerful. If you'll please share um, any links to those that Absolutely. organization in the chat, and um, we'd be happy to, you know, to add that to your post too on the mm -hmm. internet, um, on the, on Instagram. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work. I I know it, there's never enough time, but um, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and everyone in the audience, please feel free to um, add your comments or questions in the chat and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to them towards the end. I'm gonna um, move on to our next presenter, uh, Joshua. Um, Joshua Hussein uh, Hashem Zadeh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, you got it, you got yeah, it. It's yeah, a tough name. No, no worries. But welcome. Um, and uh, Joshua live, lives and works in LA. Um, I'll give a little introduction. His work is often derived from collected objects and topographies. Um, and he's built an investigation of, of lang uh, language and its link to art historical pedagogy, socioeconomic critiques and cultural iconicism through his artwork. Uh, as a mixed race, first generation American, uh, Joshua has built both his curatorial and artistic practices 
um, on the idea of reflecting um, on ideas of belonging and ideological systems of value and classification. So Joshua is gonna be presenting a select small uh, intimately scaled works from his Reliquary Memes series, also known as Folklore Objects, which are built upon letters uh, sent on postcards uh, from Los Angeles throughout the 20th century. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Hey, thanks. I'll try and be quick. I know we're, we're strapped for time. Um, just before I go to, as a context, you know, the size of these intimately scaled works are roughly as such. And uh, they're, they're really based on a postcard. Um, that's, you know, so it's, it's a very uh, material driven series. It's something that I've been working on um, for about the last three years in conjunction with other other stuff. Um, but the work that I submitted specifically for this um, is one such card that I thought maybe pandered more towards a conversation of immigration, labor, and um, some of my own personal histories, which a lot of these become sort of reflective of. Um, they, they really kind of came out of my time at SFAI and reading uh, literature like City of Quartz, um, and some essays by like Mike Kelly, who, who talked extensively about folklore, iconicism. Um, and kind of bringing that home, I, I had been working as an artist for a while and it wasn't until I hit a period of being unhoused and, and starting to, to think about like how to reassess my art practice. Um, and so scale became a necessity, right? To think small uh, in order to still create dialogue and discourse. And I love the idea of postcards because the material itself has such a diasporic quality, right? It's, it's meant for people not from a place to send to people uh, in, in a different place than, than where you obtain that object. And so there's this kind of constant exchange of ideas and, and cultural um, influence on, in terms of how people enact with that object. Um, and also the fact that, of course, they come from different parts of time um, also really kind of um, embellish that as well. So I'm going to screen share just from my site real quick so you guys have some context. Um, so this is just my, my site. Um, you can see, you know, several of them, they're all done on layers of resin and glass in between, um, like the kind of sandwich postcard and I'll show you like a 3D. Like you can kind of see the actual literature on the back, which is used to generate the text on the front. So I really want to identify colloquial phrases that may be culturally specific to where I am now, but hold maybe a different context from the time that these things were were created. Um, and of course, these are some influences where, you know, art history was playing a role as well, and, and mark making plays a huge role in these as well. Um, this is the piece that um, I, I had proposed. Um, and I can get a another close up on this. Um, and so it's, it's RMSR2 watermelon. It's just a coded thing, kind of borrowing from abstract expressionists, uh, reliquary meme series two watermelon. And what it depicts is Alavera Street. Um, this postcard was produced in 1949. Um, and usually when I find these materials, I'm always thinking about them in the context of that time first and the context of the person who wrote these and, and what was going on in LA at the time. And then extrapolating things from my own narrative to try and cement that into you know contemporary discourse. Um, and so this being a year before my dad was born, um, I thought you know heavily about his journey here. Uh, also, uh, Alvera Street being a very you know traditionally um, you know Hispanic cultural uh, area within you know, LA um, that kind of harkens back to like the missionary histories here and things like that. Um, I thought that this this would be a piece that kind of spoke to this idea of not only like immigration to Los Angeles, but this idea of exoticism uh, as well from wherever these people, you know, anyone who's immigrating here, wherever they come from, there's always this idea of boosterism kind of on both sides of the equation, right? Coming here and then also reminiscing to, to where you no longer are. Um, and so this, this work, Watermelon, it takes a sort of strange title, but uh, backstory a little bit from my family. Like I, when my grandfather and, and father came the U.S. Um, during the Iranian Revolution of 78, 79, um, you know, they, they'd come here not with much. And like the, the big thing, as many immigrants uh, do, the American dream was to own property in the U.S., to find belonging within this new landscape. And um, for me, looking at, at this work and trying to 
think about um, you know text that was written on the back, one phrase that stood out to me was a wonderful trip, right? As one does say about a, a trip to somewhere on vacation, you know, what a wonderful trip. Um, but what that meant for someone who maybe wasn't doing this on vacation, but instead someone who was on a trip because they had to and they had nowhere else to go. And um, so the text, it's done on layers, which you can't see as much here. Um, I'll just do the same ones so you can see them uh, a little more flat. But um, yeah, so the text is broken up on layers and through color as well. And so you'll see that like a wonderful trip is broken down and can be read multiple ways where the letters in black spell out literally Iran and, and show a point of origin or even the way that they're composed where at the bottom you have this sort of RIP, which is almost like a, you know, um, respect to ones that maybe didn't make it or respect to ones who made it and are no longer remembered and celebrated because maybe their culture was um, taken from them or they just, you know, had to, to find a way to adapt to where they are now. Um, and so th this was a, a card that I, I really enjoyed. Um, the reason it's called watermelon is because I found myself again in, in a place where I needed to um, kind of get on my feet after school and, and being in the house as an artist. And it wasn't until walking through the streets of my neighborhood, you know, always having a fascination with with suburban homes and architecture and things like that. I came across a neighbor um, not too far from where my father lived and he was growing watermelons on the outside, uh, you know, sidewalk area of, of his home. And um, I had just gone up on his door. I was interested in agricultural, uh, urban ag agriculture. And I knocked on his door and I said, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing as a sense of community and, and starting these kinds of initiatives. And um, as we got to talking, you know, one thing led to another. And although we started talking about community projects and things like that, I started, you know, discussing uh, businesses that he was in and, and things like that. And he had been wrapped up in real estate, you know, evidently, what, what are the chances? And um, that led to uh, working a little bit as a side hustle while working as an artist and curator and stuff um, in property management and ultimately got me a space uh, where I lived with another one of my former SFAI roommates. And it, it was the thing that gave us our studio to work and produce work. And of course, like that then became the moment that all this work could then come into the world and exist again in my practice. And so a wonderful trip really took, you know, all the ups and downs of that um, and all the randomness of that and really tried to articulate my spot within this landscape, um, within this time, and, and how that's a story that I think many people relate to. Well, these are, are great. Um, you know, this precious small piece has so many layers to it. And I, I've known your work for quite some time. And I know how text is at the forefront of your work, too. Um, and your manipulation of the fonts to express like a different um, messaging and, and cultural elements is also powerful and, and your play with the individual letters is great um shows you that scale is uh is not everything you know because i also was so excited i was looking through your website and this week and looking at this whole series because together you know all these little postcards these constructions these artworks together really speak at, at a very global level um i was thinking i don't, I don't know maybe you might have touched upon this but i was thinking and looking at all of your work together how, you know, society, when we travel, like we want to send, or we used to <laughs> always send a postcard, right? Um, you would send your friends and family a postcard. It was a thing and a novelty and everyone appreciated value, but bringing the postcards together in a different format and thinking how we're bringing in things from abroad or foreign things back to our home or our country, um, you know, our country especially is quite controversial and welcoming foreign um, elements, although it's what our country is, is made of, you know, we, we kind of value travel and, and connection with culture, but then we don't treat uh, immigrants with respect here. Um, and so I just thought the postcard was such an interesting um, a double entendre sort of symbol in, in, in that way of, of meaning. Um, you had mentioned, um, I think you mentioned something in lines with that. Is that something you've considered? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I mean, I think that the idea of, of bringing narrative to a place, right? Like a postcard typically is not meant for someone who lives in that place, right? It's meant for someone else. And so it's this kind of like unassuming mechanism in this, this cycle of boosterism and economic development and labor and, and all of this, right? It's trying to get people, and California is like the epitome of this, right? Like there's always a gold rush every 10 years. Like 
it's insane. So <laughs> you end up with with people here, you know, from all over the world, uh, from all walks of life, and you know, cultures and all those things. And when they come, I mean, it's it's a really kind of intimate relationship I have with the materials because it starts with reading the words of, of someone else always it's never even the words that exist on the front are never my own really and and that's kind of what this is it's trying to find narrative uh that links us rather than divides us um and thinking about how one's experience although maybe completely you know physically and chronologically separated um can still be as empathetically connected today as it ever was and, and maybe i'm seeing la in a different way but in in this sense i think that it gives them a voice that still exists sometimes in some cases, a hundred plus years later. Uh, and for me to also be able to look back in a place that, you know, I'm a first generation American in and say, you know, I'm, I'm as involved in a tradition of landscape painting with these as any other kind of settler coming to, to a new place, right? And trying to understand a location through this articulation of environment, through this articulation of personal experience. Um, and even like the text that you mentioned, you know, oftentimes, that's taken from, you know, local shops, like, I mean, this one literally from a Chinese restaurant down the street from my old place, you know, and it's like, where, where does this idea of cultural representation come from? And then the kind of like pantomime behind some of that as, as you get into a place like LA where everyone's kind of butting up against each other. And, you know, sometimes things are conflicting, as you mentioned, this country has had a reputation. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just one of those things that you confront and for me on this scale, it was just kind of an easy way to do that. Yeah, well, beautifully done. And and thank you. All of your last comments are right on. And I think, um, you know, really echoing what we've seen in Pablo's work and Irena's work, like how, um, you know, all of you are drawing outside of yourselves, but from your personal experience of your families being immigrants or immigrant stories and bringing that into your work, um, but speaking globally. So, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on and then hopefully everyone think about your questions to pop into chat. And uh, thanks, Joshua. Yeah, absolutely. And Lynn Sachs, I'm going to um, ask you to join us. Loyar, if you'll spotlight her. Hi, Lynn. Hello. Hi, welcome. Um, Lynn is coming to us from Brooklyn, New York. So I love uh, thinking about where everyone's joining. <laughs> from today. Um, Lindsay MFA uh, from, in film from uh, 1989, and she creates cinematic works that defy genre through the use of hybrid forms and cross-disciplinary collaboration, incorporating elements of the essay film, collage, performance, documentary, and poetry. So with each project, Lynn investigates the implicit connection between the body, the camera, and the materiality of film itself. So amazing work. Um, loved looking through your website and seeing uh, your other work. Um, she's produced 40 films as well as numerous projects for web installation and performance. And her films have been screened at venues such as the Museum of Modern Art, the Wexner Center for the Arts, the Walker, the Getty, and at festivals, including the New York Film Festival and the Sundance Film Festival. And she's had retrospectives of her work um, at the Museum of the Moving Image, at Sheffield Doc Fest, Buenos Aires International Festival of Independent Cinema, and the Festival International Nuevo Cine in Havana, as well as China Women's Film Festival. So an amazing um, career you've had to date. Uh, today, uh, yeah, we're really happy um, to have shared and, and to be taking a look again at um, her uh, film, The Washing Society, uh, that was co-directed by Lynn and Lizzie Olesker. And um, it's really bringing us into the New York City laundromats and the experience of the people who work there. So thank you. I'll let you take it away. Oh, thanks. I'm really glad to be here. And actually, I think my talk uh, will <laughs> kind of build on some of the things Irina said and also Joshua. Uh, I think that the San Francisco Art Institute has been through a lot of changes, as we know. But one of the things that was um, not really a part of my experience in the late 80s was an, actually an intention to engage with your current reality, at least in the film department. There was kind of a resistance in some ways to being 
uh, responsive to your contemporary now. There was like kind of emphasis in some, like in certain ways towards uh, kind of the history of the sort of structuralist sensibility, but it was changing. And what for me, one of those changes was when uh, Carol E. Schneeman came to teach for a semester and she kind of shook up the conversation. And um, the one of the things Arena brought up was this, was this to me, um, relationship of our bodies to our to the cloth that envelop us, envelops us. And as, if you know Carol Lee's work, she was so interested in the skin and then the kind of in that those connections that happen both materially and in the society beyond. And so when I was looking at your work, Arena, I was thinking about the this sort of haptic connections that we could try to explore in our own and even in film, see the thing is with film and now we've moved to the digital, there's always this resistance to, um, to kind of being an site specific and, and being um, uh, uh, in your, in my case, in a very urban reality. And I also wanted to say, um, Joshua, with your work that um, I was, you, you were talking about diaries and the diaries of immigration and that is something that I'm also trying to explore. And I think that people often talk about numbers and demographics when they talk about immigration instead of this more internal flow and passage. So the piece that I wanted to show you is called The Washing Society, but I, I'll give you just a very brief background. It started as a site-specific piece called Every Fold Matters. And we did these um, perform per these sort of dramatic, multimedia performances in laundry mats all over New York City. And I collaborated with a playwright and then it became a film. So I'm just gonna show you like maybe two minutes of the film. day and a normal nine hour day I do myself no less than 25 to 26 bags I think that I fold over a thousand pieces of clothes a day and and you know just little articles socks you know underwear all of them have to be turned inside out one by one every piece counts Hallino 20 African American laundresses meet to form the Washington Society. They demand respect and control over their work. They go door to door asking other laundresses across the city to join their strike. In three weeks, the Washington Society grows from 20 to 3,000 strikers. <laughs> I just showed. It's that, that's actually a, a 45 minute film. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I think that that in my interest in uh, the presence of labor and the intimacy that happens, particularly in a large city through labor, how you connect with uh, a, a 
a person who works in the clothing industry, for example, who's this far away from your body and knows more about you than you know about that person and that kind of reciprocity that doesn't run into directions. Um, these were things that I really wanted to explore in this piece. Um, and uh, I wanted to say one other thing that touches on something that Irene brought up, and I think these are, Irina, um, these collaborative relationships that have become so important to us, people call it social engagement, whatever it is, but if we can open up the hermetic space of art making. And so with this work, we tried to work with a, it's more, it's like a very renegade um, union organizing um, uh, uh, center. It's called the Laundry Work and Workers Center. And they try to unionize uh, mostly immigrant workers who are working in small laundromats all over New York City and um, creating boycotts and protests. And so one of the things that we tried to do was to bring them in to talk about their uh, efforts in the city and also to be part of our uh, presentation. Did they sometimes have hand out brochures or they actually are, some of the people from the Laundry Workers Center are now working on a book that we're doing that's coming out of this project, which right now I think it might be called Handbook Manual, something to do with hands. So they're writing kind of introspection. So I think that that, that intention of, of breaking down the, the barriers um, has been a real of interest to, to me. So that's my work. Thank you. Yeah. And, um... Just your work is very moving. I, I do have to point out that um, you help that collage work as well, laundry collage, which is great. Oh, thank to you. See, yeah, how you've translated elements from these video works and film works into you know physical work. So many of the artists today, you know, we move through different media, um, and the elements that you know your work highlights especially, but also Pablo mentioned it at the end of his presentation before I cut him off, but just the systems that happen as a result of immigration, you know, when people are brought together in a context of labor, and then the the, the bonding and, and the support networks that happen officially or unofficially, you know, you're, you're highlighting that, I mean, the resulting unions, you know, bring um, rights to immigrants and workers, you know, whether it's the the bags of food or, you know, as uh, Josh was explaining, like the, the many different parts that, that people have to put together to survive, you know, from watermelons to real estate. You know, I think it's, um, these are all beautiful elements. And I, I think that's where this conversation, while the narrative seems very strong on immigration, there, there's definitely that component of labor, which your work kind of directly addresses on the forefront, but but the immigrant experience is there, um, generations back or or first generation, like the, the man with the subtitles. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, your work's really um, just so layered. I was curious like how you um, really were drawn to, as it seems like a lot of your projects are using the laundry mat as a, as a platform. I mean, I know you, you work through, um, you know, the lens of maybe the female experience, you know, but what is the, how did the laundry mat become? Well, I, I actually will say something about even the word labor, um, because uh, in, in filmmaking, there's a, there's a kind of paradigm of, of production, which is usually a pyramid, and there's the director at the top, and everyone else involved um, is kind of standing in that person's shadow, the director of the movie star, one of those. Mm -hmm. So of course I'm not really in that industry, you know, being here today, mm -hmm. but I think that also there's a, a, a there's a real commitment that I have to bringing out down this notion of taking someone's, even in, in a documentary practice or a kind of playful, but taking someone um, from who is in front of your camera and having them serve you in your career like how do we address that? How do we um, continue to have them, uh, you know, be involved? And I've been making films for a long time, and you know, their images travel with you. But how do you, when do you say good goodbye? And can you not say goodbye and have that that labor become like 
I made an artwork, like have everyone have this sense of a kind of creative involvement or spirit or conversation. So um, that, that kind of is, you were asking about some of my other work and I think that aspect has traveled through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. And um, I'm having to move forward. I um, am keeping an eye on, on the chat, but I'll um, also just directly open it up briefly after we hear from Rosario. So um, Rosario, if Lior, if you can bring her into the spotlight, thank you. Thank you for coming and being patient. Um, always hard to stop talking about projects, but you know we, uh, I know we have these five amazing artists here today. Um, and Rosario is in San Francisco, correct? Yes. Oh, great. His Valley. <laughs> oh, terrific. One of my favorites. <laughs> um, well, Rosario was an MFA, Rosario Sol uh, Soltello, uh, from 2008. Um, she's a Chicana artist whose experimental films and installations explore themes of time, consciousness, and indigenous spirituality. Uh, she earned her MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute and has participated in art residencies in Nicaragua and Guatemala. Her art has been exhibited at the Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, Pais Art Biennial in Guatemala, Red Cat and Echo Park Film Center in Los Angeles, Artist Television Access in San Francisco, Shape Shifter Cinema in Oakland, and Lyft in Toronto. She was born in Salinas and raised near the Mexican border, but as I said, currently lives in San Francisco. And today, um, are you sharing both videos with us or, or which one are you? I can share both. I'm gonna go pretty quick. Okay, so great. I think I can fit it all in. Wonderful. Well, she um, submitted two really powerful videos um, that are very distinctive. So um, I'll just let you take it away. Thank you so much. All right, I'll just start sharing here. So can someone just tell me if you can see? I cannot. Okay, we can't yet. How about now? No? no. Not oh. yet, just your video. Oh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> um, how about now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, first of all, thanks for um, inviting me and for everyone. You know, it's really nice to be here sharing some of this work with you. Um, uh, I am gonna go in chronological order and I'm gonna start with um, Santuario, my stop motion video that was part of an exhibition um, called Sanctuary City, Ciudad Santuario, 18, 19, 18, 1989 to uh, 2009 at Queens Nails Gallery here in San Francisco. The lead artist was Sergio de la Torre, along with five other uh, collaborating artists from SFAI, including myself. Um, Sanctuary City directly commented on the San Francisco's uh, sanctuary, sanctuary Ordinance from 1989. And this ordinance prohibits city employees from aiding federal immigration agents unless they are required to do so by federal or state law or a warrant. Um, so I have the video here, let's see if I can share it with you. Um, it's about a minute long and it's a video uh, that I made in response to a case of racial profiling by police in the Latino community um, in which a San Francisco resident was actually, you know, was pulled over for having a rosary hanging from their vehicle's uh, rear view mirror. Um, and by hanging the rosaries from the mirror, rear view mirror, um, as Sergio and I drove uh, through the streets around um, in, in the mission, we were referencing this uh, racial ethnic profiling 
And the rosaries also created a sanctuary of sorts in the, in the car. Uh, let's see if I can show, go back to, this is a, an installation view of the video. And in the background, you can see a um, part of a 20 year timeline of uh, all of the US immigration laws from 1989 to 2009, as well as a piece by another artist in the space. Um, and the, the whole ex exhibition was at, uh, again, Queensnell's um, projects, uh, which was uh, in the Mission District. And it was right in front of a bus stop where uh, many Latino uh, migrants waited to commute downtown for work. And so there was this, um, you know, they were able to come into the gallery and even there were Sharpies where um, you could add comments and things like that onto the timeline. Uh, so my research for this project, uh, we actually worked on it for about a year. Um, it included uh, recording testimonials at uh, hearings organized by the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and the Immigrant Rights Commission. Um, I went on to collaborate directly with an undocumented woman who had to wear an electronic ankle monitor um, to be able to stay in the United States. Um, and I was able to get to know her and her story, which helped inform my work. Um, so the I started the research here in San Francisco and I continued with this project when I went to uh, Nicaragua for an artist residency. And um, while I was there, I met two local, local women. One um, of them owned a furniture shop and the other one was a street vendor. And I shared the stories of the immigrant women in San Francisco with them. And they came up with this idea to knit covers for the ankle monitors as a gesture of solidarity. Um, and using my, um, in this case, my 16 millimeter film camera, I documented um, the making of the covers in the context of their work environment. But it also became a document of their, um, their relationship um, so let's go to that clip. So this is just an one minute clip of um, guerrillas. And these are, um, and it's silent. So I'm gonna end the sound. Sorry about that. Um, and so this video installation uh, was first uh, presented here at the Galeria de la Raza. Um, in that case, it was just the video. And after that, the installation traveled to the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art for another um, group exhibition there. So here's an installation view um, at the um, Utah Museum of Contemporary Art, and then a close up of the actual um, covers, knitted covers. So I think I can stop there and leave t more time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosario. Um, yes, um, I'd love to uh, allow the audience to chime in if you have any questions for Rosario to start, and then any of the other artists. Feel free to um, just jump in. Well, I, I did have um, just a, a comment um, and then uh, I'm happy to also address any other questions, but I, I really love seeing how as an artist, you're bringing together um, this very um, 
the the knitting, the the work of of that woman from Nicaragua, you know, and and her way of connecting with the story you brought of the woman from San Francisco and and how you used video and installation and um, these materials that you know speak a little bit to I think you use the wording indigenous spirituality like this is again kind of speaking to that um, that quiet layer of these um, systematic you know or, or uh, these unofficial sort of support systems that are such an important part of the fiber of, of supporting immigrants um, and the experience and, and situations in labor so I mean, again, it goes back to the, the plastic bags from the drawings of Pablo's that were used to support those refugees, and and um, I just I just thought that was really beautiful because not everything is is so loud, you know. These the source of strength for a lot of the experience uh, experiences of of surviving, you know, as immigrants comes come from these organic creations. Um, Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm trying to see, I uh, I personally am just so proud of this exhibition and that, you know, SFAI alums have um, chosen to address it directly through their work. Um, I think that we've always been bold in um, figuring out ways to have these uh, more controversial conversations and bring work to light. And so, um, you know, as uh, it's been a challenging year for the institution, SFAA has worked hard to bring together um, the spirit of the community of the artists and, and showcase voices that, you know, exist and um, are working out in the field, you know, we're producing our work and, and it's so important. Um, I am thankful for everyone who showed up today and the panelists and all of the artists who've been part of the exhibition. I know that time ran away from us, but um, thank you so much for, for today. And uh, I hope I, I got everyone's, um, I, I was looking for questions, but this is has been recorded. And so we'll be posting it on the website so that you can share it or rewatch it. And, uh, I think I think that's it for today. It's a wrap. Lior, thank you for all your technical help and uh, congratulations to everyone on your work. Thank, thank you. you Beth. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank truly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you to see you all out there. It's been yeah. wonderful getting to know your practice is all of it. All of thank them. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.